Across America. Live, this is Point of View. And now, Kirby Anderson. As we've been advertising, we have John Whitehead with us now. And over this last year, we've spent some time talking about his book. With him, A Government of Wolves, The Emerging American Police State. A book of about 280 pages. If that's not enough, his latest book now, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, 330 pages. So if you put the two together, over 600 pages of well-documented abuses that are taking place right before our very eyes. John Whitehead is an attorney and author and in 1982 established the Rutherford Institute, which is a nonprofit civil liberties and human rights organization, which is located in Charlottesville, Virginia. You can search certainly read his daily commentaries and weekly commentaries on the website rutherford.org we have a link to that as well and john we once again come back to this issue of the police state that we find ourselves in so thank you for joining us hey thanks for having me on kirby Seventeen thousand local police forces are equipped with such military equipment as black hawk helicopters machine guns grenade launchers battering rams chemical sprays some even have tanks what do they need tanks for that's a good question. <laughs> it depends. You know, there are small towns, you know, of uh, less than a thousand people that have uh, the Humvees, the tank light vehicles. Three point two. Uh, one town has eight hundred thirty-five people has three point two million dollars worth of military gear from the federal government, from sniper rifles to grenade launchers. So, they're handing them out. Uh, supposedly, President Obama is going to issue a report limiting some of this equipment how it flows, but. Looking at the uh, what he's proposing, I think it's going to continue, plus all the spy equipment that not only government agents have, but they hand out to local police, too, such as Stingray devices, which are they act as fake cell phone towers or little boxes that fit in policemen's cars. They go by your house and download everything you're doing on your cell phone and laptop. So I think the nation's going to continue much the way it has over the past many years. You have pointed out in uh, the previous book, and you go into even more detail in your new book, which, again, we have links to so that people can order it. And, of course, they'll probably find it in a local bookstore. I've seen your books. And, matter of fact, I bought this one in a bookstore, so I imagine most people will be able to find it. But the point that you've made in both of these books is there is a mentality when you dress up this way. In other words, if you're part of a SWAT team, you come in with sort of a military mindset. You've got pictures here of people in SWAT team camouflage. And if you weren't to tell me that that was in Ferguson, Missouri, I would think that that might be in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, is that a danger in itself? Yes, as I show in my books. And by the way, uh, I just dialogue here about two hours ago with a former police chief. He 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 was uh, talking about the same thing when his uh, he said when a lot of his policemen dressed up in their gear, their some of their camouflage outfit or their black SWAT team gear. He says their mentality changed. He says you're right. I've seen it. So. What the uh, psychologists say that when uh, you, you get in the gear, the guns, the helmets, the black outfits, and you're ready to raid someone's home, you're really going in looking for enemy combatants. And there are 80,000 SWAT team raids that are occurring across the United States today. That's up from 3,000 in the mid-1980s. Eighty percent of those are for a mere warrant service where a policeman used to show up and knock on the door and ask if you were the person they were looking for. And as I document in my book, all the people that are getting shot and killed, killing dogs, Many times they're in the wrong homes because they're not following the Fourth Amendment. So their psychology does change. And by the way, many seasoned police I work with have talked to me. I had one come up to meet with me in my office not too long ago, and he says, I'm really concerned about even when people walk with somebody on the streets today, their, their demeanors change. It isn't like they used to be where they walk up and chat with you. They walk up like authority figures now, which reverses what the Founding Fathers gave us. Supposedly, the police or any government official is a public servant, and we're, supposed to, we're supposedly the masters since our taxes pay their bills. We sort of come full circle, and you say that in one of your commentaries, that uh, remember in 1776, that's what started this, the fact that we were held captive, if you will, by the British uh, officers at that time, and the whole issue of uh, Second Amendment developed in large part because they were trying to take the guns away from the militia, and now we've gone from being captive by the British police state into what has become kind of an American police state, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. The reason we have the Bill of Rights is because of what they went through. And it wasn't they were concerned about taking the guns away from the militia. The militia were just people who lived in their homes and gathered together. These were farmers and stuff with their guns. 
taking people's guns away, which they saw as a real danger. And that's why we have the Second Amendment. And why we have the Fourth Amendment is, is just uh, the, I have a quote in my new book, Battlefield America, the War on American People, from James Otis, the famous colonial lawyer. And the reason I put it, when I read the quote, I said, I've got to put this in the book and talk about it. But he says, the British are coming through their doors. They're smashing down our doors. They're throwing our citizens to the floor. And I went, he's, he's talking about a SWAT team, right? <laughs> so that's why you have the Fourth Amendment. They, and again, if, you, if you're really careful, I tell people, most people have never read the Bill of Rights. Yes. Let me read the first, this, the first section. Of, and it's, just, it's only like 20 words. The Fourth Amendment. I call it the Fourth Commandment, by the way. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures and shall not be violated. They were given commands in this to the government. They were. And that's saying you will not violate, you will not crash into our homes. You will not grab us on the streets and do and frisk us without a warrant. Uh, but today, I mean I talk to some policemen today that are not sure what's in the Fourth Amendment. They look at me like I'm nuts. And I always tell law enforcement officers, I said, you're a law enforcement officer, what law are you enforcing? They kind of look, I said, not the city's laws, you're, you're enforcing the Constitution. <laughs> that's, your main, that's your first job, because you take an oath to uphold and defend it. So please know what's in the Fourth Amendment. And when I speak and, I'm, and I read that first sentence, I have people come up to me after and say, hey, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't really realize that. These are Americans. These are Americans. And so well, are lawyers, by the way. Yeah, well, that's a sad reality. We've talked about that before. Kelly Shackelford joins us usually on a uh, Friday, and I think we even have uh, Jay Seculo on later this week, because they'll say that sometimes they don't even talk about that in law school. And you wonder, well, what do you study in the law school if you don't study the Constitution? But one of the things you make a point of is the constitutional safeguards against police abuse means nothing if they can crash through your door, terrorize your children, and as you even point out, shoot your dogs. You've got all sorts of stories here of uh, service dogs and other dogs that have been shot simply because they were seen as, quote, a threat to an individual that had barged into the door in the first place. That's why we have a Fourth Amendment. But just to give you a few cases, one with the case of Jose Guerrero in Arizona, a decorated Marine, the police were doing a sweep of his neighborhood looking for marijuana. Uh, going into different homes, well, they went to his home at 3 a.m. in the morning, and a flashbang grenade goes off, and so what does Jose do? He takes his wife and kid, puts them in the closet, he stands at the end of his hallway with the only thing he has uh, to defend himself, which is his hunting rifle. The police sweep into his home, see him at the end of the hallway, and they he thinks they're burglars. They fire 70 sometimes, hit him over 50, and he dies on the floor, bleeds to death. They say he fired at him. An investigation showed the weapon, the safety never came off his weapon. Uh, but see, that's the problem in going in the home. And here's the other thing. They found no marijuana in his home. Yep. They had just followed the warrant procedure during the daytime and knocked on his door that have found this man was guilty of nothing other than being a decorated Marine and being a father and a, and a good citizen at that. But those are, you know, those are the cases we see. Uh, again, the mentality has changed when you see a, a man running away from a policeman and he shoots him four times in the back of an mm. armed citizen. Yeah. That, listen, you go back 30 years ago and that happens, people are up in arms over that. Today, it's happening regularly. You're seeing people, innocent people getting shot. I mean, when you, when you go to Baltimore, by the way, the Baltimore situation, uh, we can talk about that in a minute, but, I mean, that, that was the telling the statistics there. We'll talk right about that right after these important messages. You're listening to Point of View, your listener-supported source for truth. John Whitehead with us, and again, I would commend to you his previous book, A Government of Wolves, The Emerging American Police State. The book that you'll find in the bookstore now is Battlefield America, The War on the American People. And John, you were talking about, and I, of course, raised uh, Ferguson, you just raised uh, Baltimore, but oftentimes Stephen say to my African-American friends, you're seeing all this through the lens of race, but it's a broader issue than this. Uh, people that aren't even African-American are also being assaulted by the police, and you need to understand that this is a bigger picture about the militarization of the police force and the loss of our basic constitutional rights. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's the key, is understanding that uh, just how the police view us differently today. And, and, and let me say this. I work with a lot of good policemen around the country. They don't like this, and they're taking stands against that. In fact, some of the radio interviews I do, I've got a, a policeman 
on the panel with me, and he's agreeing 100 percent with me. He's seeing it; he doesn't like it. But you know, go back to Baltimore. There, there are trends, and again, uh, it's how we view people today. As a Christian, how how do we view people? I happen to be a Christian. Uh, I don't want to do to somebody what uh, I wouldn't want them doing to me. And I'm, t- I'm telling people, we no longer teach the golden rule. If we taught t- the golden rule in police departments, I think you would see a lot of things change. Your life, st- from 2010 on in Baltimore, this is key, uh, there are almost uh, there are a number of people killed. 70% of them were black that were shot by police, 40% unarmed. Uh, the, those statistics were available to, to the city fathers, mothers, whoever was running the city, <laughs> they should have seen right away, something's wrong here. Yes, This is not what we should be doing. We should be putting our police out on the streets, put those brown uniforms back on the police, and, and have them uh, walk in the neighborhoods, have them deal with the people. And here's the other thing. 70% of the policemen in Baltimore live outside the city, some as far away as uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So you don't have local police. That's true. And this is the key. So you need local police in your community. They should live in your community. They should be one of you. And it makes it much more difficult for them to treat you like you're an enemy combatant at that point. So what I'm emphasizing when I talk to people in their communities, make sure they live in your community. Don't have them being people transported from the outside because they're arriving in foreign territory. That isn't really their city. That's just happened to be a corporation or something where they work. You know, one of the things you talked about in your earlier book, A Government of Woes, is how Child Protective Services intrudes. But in this new book, you have all sorts of stories about how the police themselves are going after 16-year-old, 14-year-olds, 11-year-olds. Uh, let's talk about a few of them. I mean, you have, of course, this autistic child that's oh, only 11 years of age, uh, charged with disorderly conduct and felony assault after doing what? Sometimes a young child, especially that's autistic, does, and I think he kicked a f- trash can. But all this happened oh, yeah. because of that case. Case that we're looking into right now, believe it or not, a four-year-old. Listen, was throwing a tantrum tantrum at preschool, public school. His mother lived ten minutes away. They called the mom. She was on her way. All right. The school resource officer came in, grabbed the kid, and put him in handcuffs. Then called the local police, who arrived quickly, took him to the police station, and put him in leg shackles and then put him in an isolation room. His mother finally arrives at the police station frantic. There's the kid screaming and crying. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so, again, there, uh, for some reason, some of the police, and again, and it's usually with Child Protective Services. Another case we had in Florida was the Nicole Ganey case, where the mother on a Saturday afternoon, a working mom, her kid wanted to go down to the playground a half a mile away, yes. and the, a playground that he went every day on his bicycle back and forth to school. He passed it every day. He goes down in place. She puts a cell phone uh, carrier around his neck. She was in communication. The police grab him off the playground, bring him home in the back of the police car. Do not let the kid out. The kid's crying in the back of the police car because he's on the playground playing by himself. Do, do not tell the mother why they're there. Just say your son's, uh, something's happened to your son. She starts weeping and crying, thinking her son's been hurt. They handcuff her on the porch, set her down, handcuffs behind her back. Then bring the kid out of the car, having walked by, he's seven years old. He sees his mom crying, and he starts crying and say, Mama, this is my fault. They charge her with five years in jail and $5,000 fine for child neglect. This is in working with Child Protective Services. We got in the case and got a good criminal lawyer and threatened to file a lawsuit, and they backed off. But what is the mentality, I ask, that would do something like that? But am I, listen, I don't know about you, but I walked a mile to school and a mile back every <laughs> oh, yeah. day. My parents didn't know where I was for hours on end, maybe <laughs> on an entire port of a day, you know. Yeah, my mother, I, I yeah. remember my mother when I was young saying, uh, I'll see you at dinner. That was yeah. 8 o'clock yeah, in the morning. Yeah, I remember those days. <laughs> <laughs> but today, the, the government now is assuming it's the parent. Well, and again, that uh, story, you also have a picture of uh, the seven-year-old and, of course, Nicole, and you know, that was a good resolution. But you've had some others. I know you had a 16-year-old who was charged with resisting arrest, and we're talking about he was stopped, he was tackled, he was punched, he was kneed, he was tasered, he was yanked by his hair. This is a 16-year-old who doesn't strike me as the kind of bad kid that no. uh, deserved even a third of that. Those cases are happening daily in some some states. Uh, I mean, it happens daily in middle school. They're tasering kids in middle school. Tasering, yes, you had tasering, that. Tasering, dropping uh, them down. Yeah, I just. Amazing. I also saw the case in Kansas that we offered to help on, where the 
mother was doing cannabis oil. Did you see that case in Kansas? Oh, sure, yes. Yeah, I know what you're talking and about. he talked yeah. about it in class. Well, they grabbed the kid and interrogate him in the school, the police, armed police, with a photo. And then they go uh, try to do an illegal search of her home. And now they've taken her kid away, and she can't even see him. But what, what you're seeing today is, uh, and it's a philosophy, the, state, the government assumes that it's the parent now. So that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with an institution that, again, you go back 30 or 40 years ago, you didn't see that mentality. So things have definitely shifted to where, uh, especially public schools, think that, you're, that basically the child, their property, and they're going to do whatever they want to do with that child. Are there solutions? It seems to me that certainly the criminal justice system and the civil justice system is part of it. I think uh, maybe uh, getting more police officers to say, you know, w- what we're doing here has just gone entirely too far and uh, maybe be the kind of people that sit on the panels with you. But what kind of recommendations do you have? Uh, retraining, reorienting, like I said, how we view people. Um, I, you know, the cases we get into, it was the four-year-old kid that was shackled in school. I mean, I talked to a psychologist said, I could have walked that kid out in 30 seconds and sent him down the hallway and talked to him. Why use force? But when you've got all the force objects and your mentality is, is this kid is our property, essentially. What you see in public schools today, I mean, I talked to teachers working, and they believe that, that, you know, listen, I have kids, listen, I talked to a group of kids not too long ago, they were fifth graders. And they gave me a list of bad words they couldn't say. Mm. And I was shocked. You know what one of them was? What? G- gun. Gun. Oh, yeah. Well, I can believe I that. Said, I said, wait a second. Do you see movies? I said, yes. Do they have those things? And they go, yes. I said, what do you call them? <laughs> and they put their hands over their mouth. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's, it's, it's a form of indoctrination, is what I'm saying. What, we're, what they're doing in a lot of the schools that I see with all the tasering, locking kids up, is social engineering. They're getting them ready. Again, we've, we've handled hundreds of cases with these crazy zero-tolerance policies where a kid points a finger oh, yeah. and silently at another student, a grade schooler, and they pull him out and give him a weapons violation on his record. It takes the threat of a lawsuit to get it off his record. They're engineering students mentally and psychologically to accept a police state, in my opinion. Well, we're going to take a break, and if you'd like to join our conversation, 1-800-351-1212. John Whitehead will continue with us. I might just mention that Andrew Napolitano put it this way, I challenge anyone to read this book and then try to go to sleep. I found that impossible, so I might recommend that you don't read it before bedtime because it will keep you awake. And maybe when we come back, we can uh, talk about some of the issues that people have been raising. You know, you have the military training drills like Jade Helm, and you have some of these operations and uh, some of these practices in the Department of Homeland Security. And why are they buying all these uh, weapons and why all the ammunition and some of those issues? And certainly you can find very good evidence in both of those books. A Government of Wolves, the Emerging American Police State. And as I mentioned, that's been out for over a year, and you can still probably find it in your local bookstore. But the new book is just out, and you'll find it in your bookstore, Book uh, Battlefield America, The War on the American People. What I've done is given you a link to John Whitehead's website, so you can click on his picture there, and that will take you to Rutherford.org, and that will be a great way for you to learn more about him and his organization. If you click on the picture of the book, It's a way you can order it, although I suspect you'll be able to find it in your local bookstore very easily. And then we have a commentary that he has written on uh, the war on the American people that just gives you a little bit of a perspective on some of the things in the book. And so all of that is available at the website pointofview.net. You might want to do a cut and paste some of the material there and put it on your Facebook page, put it on your Twitter feed or uh, something of that nature and send it to others and uh, get the conversation going because as we've talked about today, there are some very significant challenges that we face. And one of those, of course, is the need to educate individuals. If people in law enforcement, if even people that are in the legal profession don't understand the Fourth Amendment, we do have a problem and we need to address that as well. So if you'd like to join our conversation today, 1-800-351-1212. We'll continue our conversation with John Whitehead and his new book, Battlefield America, right after these important messages. You are listening to Point of View. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. And now, here again, 
is Kirby Anderson. If you'd like to join our conversation, 1-800-351-1212, 1-800-351-1212. John Whitehead with us as we talk about his new book, Battlefield America. Just before I take some phone calls, I put on the table a couple of things. First of all, you have Jade Helm which are these military training drills and exercises. And then, of course, I also mentioned, and we've talked about this before, the massive amount of ammunition purchased by the Department of Education. Why do they need that? The IRS, the Social Security Administration. I mean, those uh, difficult-to-handle elderly. What's all of this about? Can you give us some comments about uh, some of these military exercises and the massive purchases of ammunition? Well, the point is, is that I, I think we're dealing with a very paranoid uh, federal government, as we see with in many directions. But uh, since the 1980s, to give me a, give you an idea, since the 1980s, it started under Ronald Reagan's administration. They've been doing military exercises. The people want to Google it. And I mentioned it in my book. Rex 84 was the first uh, exercise done under Rumsfeld and Cheney, by the way, on how to put down so-called American dissidents if there was a, a, an uprising. Those have continued. You have the Jade Helm exercises right now, which, in my opinion, what they're doing at this point in time is acclimating us to a partial martial law state. In fact, I would go so far as to say that we're already in a partial martial law state with a militarized police. But the idea that you have military troops on American soil working with local police, stopping people on sidewalks, some of them actually uh, going covertly through cities, uh, you're dealing with an entirely different mentality. Remember George Washington, James Madison, Jefferson all warned against standing armies or armies on American soil. That's what they faced. Again, that's why we got our, 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 our Bill of Rights, is to protect us against those kind of things. So as far as the ammunition purchases, that should be very, very concerning. The Department of Homeland Security contracted to buy from a group called the ATK Corporation 1.6 million hollow point bullets. Now, if, if I was an infantry officer, we couldn't use them. They violate international law, but when they hit your body, they expand. If you've ever seen the, the Pruder film with John F. Kennedy getting shot, the back of his head flies off. That's what happens when a hollow point bullet hits you. It, it expands in fragments of the bullet goes out into your body. It's for sure kill. John Lennon, the Beatle, by the way, was shot with five hollow point bullets. You go down the line that people were assassinated, Martin Luther King. So, um, you have the Department of Fisheries with hollow point bullets now, Social Security Administration, Department of Education. All the federal agencies are equipped with hollow point bullets and SWAT teams. In fact, the Department of Education has done SWAT team raids on overdue loans. Wow. Let's so take some phone you, calls. Yeah, I want to give you. What I'm saying yeah. is, you're dealing with an entirely different mentality than we were 30 or 40 years ago. Amazing. In Texas, KJRT, Ron, what would you like to ask of uh, John Whitehead? Yeah, that was my specific question was concerning Jade Helm. And, and I noticed that they have, if I'm correct, are there nine states that are involved in this exercise? Eight, eight states, eight states. Eight states, okay, okay. Do you know, uh, well, I know being in Texas and we've got an issue, they're supposed to go down, kind of like out down I-20, uh, kind of, do you have any information on what type of drills they're supposed to run or anything like that? And I'll hang up. Thank you. Oh, all I know is what we're in. There, there are actually military drills where they're going to be supposedly conducting exercises against what we might know call dissidents or people supposedly in an uprising. My, I, my fear is is they're planning for an economic collapse. Yes, I think so. Everything too. I'm looking at the um, every ec- economist that I talk to, people who meet with me, are saying that the economy looks terrible. We owe $16 trillion to the Chinese government, by the way. The American economy is spending like mad. We're, we could collapse. We're basically doing away with the middle class. Over 50% of Americans now spend, spend at least 50% of their income just on rent alone. So uh, it's tough. And you were mentioning the minimum wage. Yeah, they're raising the minimum wage, which makes it almost impossible for some people to get a job. Why do you, there's a list of corporations going, basically going out of business. I mean, Target's shutting down stores. Barnes & Noble's going to close, what, 300 stores in the next four or five years? So something's happening with the economy. Uh, so I think at this point in time, uh, I think Aldous Huxley in his book, Brave New World Revisited, used this word. He said the American people are being brainwashed. They will eventually be brainwashed into moving into a totalitarian regime. And by the way, 
as I point out in Battlefield America, when you see extreme violence against the citizen race, and we, it's been repeated in all regimes, you're in a transition phase to a more authoritarian regime. So that would explain the hollow point bullets, the SWAT team raids, uh, and the courts, by the way. We didn't talk about this. The courts are upholding almost all this stuff, by the way. The Supreme Court ruled two years ago in Kentucky versus King, if a SWAT team arrives at your door, they've made a mistake, they don't have a warrant, you're not the person they were looking for, but they think you might be doing something wrong inside, they can still go through the door. Amazing. Now, the, the one dissenting judge says it's the end of the Fourth Amendment, the end of the Constitution. Absolutely correct. But it's also the end of private property, which if you studied our Constitution, if you don't have that one little parcel of land you can say, I own this and you do own it, uh, get off. You really don't own that. And the cases we get where people are arrested for having a chicken in their backyard, a veteran who wants a tomato garden in his backyard is told that's against the law. In 17 states now, it's against the law to correct, collect rainwater because it's now considered government property. Mm-hmm. You can get, there's, there, there's a, it's in crazy. Texas there, there's a guy just spent 17 days in jail for overgrown grass. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm aware of that one too. I mean, it's just it's yeah. gotten to the point where everything's illegal in this country. And people, uh, when I speak, sometimes people always ask the same question: Well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, and the NSA is downloading all my emails, and down and go down the list, they are. By the way, it doesn't matter what court decisions are passed or what legislation. Everything you do electronically, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why should I care? Well, it's estimated the average American <laughs> violates three laws a day, and you don't even know it. So you could have someone arriving at your door, like the old lady in Florida who was feeding birds in her front yard. She didn't know it was against the law. Eighty years old, she was let into the courtroom in handcuffs. It's incredible. It's Again, incredible. You... This is America that we're living in now. Well, it ain't the America that Jefferson, Washington, Madison gave us. That's sir. Sure. Overabundance, as you say, 4,500 federal crimes, 400,000 rules and regulations, and like you said, it's that's estimated. That's just at the federal level. That's just the federal level. Like you no. said, we technically, the average American commits three felonies a day without knowing it, and that's just one of the many facts in the book. Battlefield America, written by John Whitehead and forward by Ron Paul. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, Ken in New Mexico, I wanted to get to your comment. Uh, you're on with John Whitehead. Hey, thank you very much for taking my call. I spent about 25 years in the military. I retired as a military police instructor, after which I spent about almost 10 years in civilian law enforcement. And as I told the lady who took my call, I concur with almost everything you say, with the exception that you mentioned that you felt like they needed retraining. And I don't think that that's going to work, and I don't think that it's enough. It didn't happened to me until I left law enforcement that I realized that I had become someone that I didn't particularly care for. So until you realize that internally and realize that there's a change in you that perhaps you didn't even know had taken place, I don't believe that a positive change can take place. I think you're making a good comment there. I do think that if if the right type of training, it would help. But to give you an example, I have a, a friend, he's a Good, good, very well educated policeman. He teaches the Fourth Amendment in one of the big academy, police academies. And one day we were talking, he said, By the way, John, I'm known as the anti cop. And I said, Why are you known as the anti cop? He said, I teach the Fourth Amendment. So you're hitting something really wow. important there. Uh, if, it's, if the training is not done well, of course it isn't. But we're going to have to change, and I keep saying this, the way we view people, government agents, the way our policemen or whoever, the way they view an American citizen. We are the masters. They're supposedly our servants. Remember, policemen, government, even Obama, the president, is a public servant. Uh, But we're not viewed like that anymore. I mean, I've been in this area 40 years as a constitutional lawyer. I found very few, very few government people that work for the government that views us, the bill, the people who pay in the bills, as the people who should be running the show. When a police officer approaches somebody on the street, please, I say, approach them with and treat them like they're people of great worth and dignity. They are American citizens. Don't walk up to them as if they're scum, because they're not. Because to give you, crime in America right now, according to the FBI, is at a 40-year low. We're not a violent people. There are crazies out here who do crazy things, but, I mean, like in Milwaukee, making people bend over and are doing anal probes on people. In Milwaukee and Oakland, there's been lawsuits over that. I mean, don't view people like that. So if we change the way we view people, sure, I think we could change things, but... That's going to be a long time coming. 
I think, because the government's not ready to do that, not with what all the stuff they're doing. No. All right. We need to take a break. When we come back, I've got a couple of calls here about uh, what is happening to our kids. Uh, one in particular, a son playing cops, gets in trouble, gets expelled, others. Uh, so we'll take a few of those because that is certainly something that is covered in John Whitehead's books. Some of that was in his earlier book, A Government of Wolves, and some more in Battlefield America. We'll take a break. We'll take some more of those phone calls. Talk about what's happening to our kids with him and your calls right after this. Now, back to Point of View, your listener-supported source for truth. Glenn Whitehead with us for a few more minutes as we talk about his book, Battlefield America. Look for it in your local bookstore. Let's go back to the phones. Heather in South Carolina, please tell us your story. Hello, John. Thank you for listening to my story. No, I was calling because when you guys were talking about a situation with the little boy, couldn't say the keyword, the gun word, it was incident where my son was at school and playing with some kids outside and they were playing good guy, you know, good cop, bad cop. And he told, you know, one of the students, you know, he didn't be the bad cop that he was going to kill her. And he ended up getting in trouble for that. And on top of that, I ended up having to meet with the principal and they gave me a choice of either, ex- either expelling him or for me voluntarily withdrawing my, my child out of the school. And I thought that was really crazy. I mean, they see it on TV, they play. And I know it's innocent. It can also be taken seriously, but I think you know, they took that to the most extreme. So I had to, like I said, withdraw my child from the actual school. And I was very disappointed in that. I really was. We need some common sense, don't we, John? Common sense. And when that happens, parents contact the Rutherford Institute. We like to swat those things down like uh, bad flies, okay? Because... That you shouldn't allow any of that to happen. In fact, uh, I would get with your friends. Uh, those policies can be changed and straightened up if parents will get in, uh, get up in arms and get down to school and change them. That's what it's going to take is local action in most of these cases. But uh, we've been involved in a lot of cases like that where a kid just does an imaginary finger with his, uh, does a pow with his, his finger sure. violently. They take him out in the hallway, start him with a weapons violation. It takes a threatening of a lawsuit to get, their, get that off their records. And by the way, they do make an electronic record. I would get that off of your child's record, and we'd be glad to look at it and, prop, and try to help you do that because you don't want that on your kid's record. Sometimes those, goes, that, those go down as weapons violations. It's just amazing. Which is insane. And again, we've been involved in a lot of those cases. But, and the media sometimes, even the media gets upset with those. And uh, that, that helps in those particular cases. We publicize them, get them out there. But... Those situations, again, it's how they view kids. They're, they're again, as I say, they're, they're training up kids to live in a police state where you're afraid to say the wrong word, where you can't say gun or this or that in schools. Again, it doesn't fit with logic. It's a form of insanity, and they're passing it down to kids. Let's take another phone call. We'll go to Jason in Georgia. I think you have another story, so I'd love to hear it. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my call, Kirby. It's a very insightful show. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, I had two comments, uh, and it just kind of shows how if, if we stand up as parents, you know, grandparents, and even Christians, that uh, sometimes we make a stand and, and sometimes make a difference. My father-in-law, he went to his granddaughter, which is nine-year-old, Honors Day, and they were serving tea to the adults. And, of course, as kids do, she reached over and grabbed his glass of tea and, and took a took a swallow of it, and the the lady who was serving says, "Sir, we we don't allow the kids to drink tea here at the school." And and my father in law, in his politest manner, he he kind of told the attendant, "Ma'am, this this is my kid. This is my grandchild. She can drink tea if she wants to." And then naturally, it was a closed kind of a closed in environment, and the other people heard it, and I think I just kind of started something. All, all the kids started drinking sweet tea, you know, and. <laughs> but, and, and yeah. And, and yeah, a, who and owns your kids? Was, That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, right. And and it, it was perfect for this show when I was listening to it. I thought about it. another one was I work for a major corporation here in Georgia, and and we pray we pray before the beginning of our shift. Uh, all our shifts do. And we were told a couple months ago that headquarters told us we could not pray anymore before our shift starts. And, and uh, while we were being told that. Uh, one of the employees just politely stood up and asked our manager, well, what are you going to do if we do pray? <laughs> and uh, could, could not answer that and just kind of politely walked out. And he was put in a bad spot in his defense. But uh, And to this day, we still pray. So, you know, there, there still is hope if, if we'll just stand up 
And uh, I know there are extremities. If we just stand up as parents and grandparents and Christians and, uh, and just not take so much of this, and, uh, and I, I just hang up and, and listen, listen to you. John, you ask a question in your book. Are we slaves or rebels? That's the point, yeah. Do you want to be a slave or do you want to be a rebel? I think, uh, yeah, uh, there was a guy named Jesus that took a whip in his hand one time and he changed some things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are some pretty powerful images out there. Martin Luther King, Jesus, Gandhi, uh, a lot of the freedom fighters, they, they just said, listen, we're going to be nonviolent. We're going to take a stand. And I highlight it in my book and I give some suggestions in my book how we can change things, but... I've seen it happen at city halls. I've seen it happen in public schools when 10 parents get up in arms and they go as a group and say, we're the united front. The politicians count numbers. They'll back off. If you take a stand, yeah, the, the world's full of people who want to push you around. But in America, you have a right to stand up. You have constitutional rights. I'm telling people, don't just let it pass by. When you see a SWAT team and you hear about a SWAT team in your area where some, somebody gets killed, a crazy SWAT team raid or something, and they violate the law, don't let that go by. Get 20 neighbors. Get down to that city council and have them create an oversight board to make sure that doesn't happen again. That can be changed, but America was built on one idea basically, and this is it. And not the government we have today, but the government where it was given to us was local government. It was to say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and, we, and you can tell the federal government, no, some three states now have uh, said we're not going to follow the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows President Obama to send the military in and arrest someone he thinks is an extremist and put them in a detention camp. They've said, no, we're not going to let our, our facilities to be used or our officers or our personnel be used and those kind of things. You can do it. But, again, it takes action, and uh, the average American watches 150 hours of television a month. Uh, I've talked to psychologists, and I talk about it in my book. It's cultural death. It's freedom death, by the way. I'm saying give me one-third of those hours a month, 70, 80 hours, and get out there and get active in your local government. Meet with your neighbors. Some people at my uh, suggestion are having uh, weekly phone meetings with their neighbors where they, they don't meet uh, physically, but they get on the phone. They say, what's going on here? How can we change this? Oh, no, they passed another stupid tax law. And you can change those things, but if you're sitting and watching continually, and by the way, you're not going to get the news off of the major news channels. It's going to be on the Internet. It's going to be on Kirby Show, Point of View, and places like that. So keep up with the good news sources. Be informed. Education precedes action. And by the way, just read the Bill of Rights. You know, folks, it's only 462 words, but boy, is it power-packed. Very good. Let's take one more quick phone call. Hubert, I think you wanted to make a comment just before we close the program off today. Yes, sir. I uh, thank you very much, Kirby, for taking my call. I uh, thank you for the gifts you have on. Uh, always make a lot of sense, and I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't listen to the news or read newspapers much, but I do listen to your program. That's where I get most of my news from. And uh, I agree with, with everything that I've heard today that your your guests and, and the people calling in have said of uh, and again, just like so many of have commented, that if we do not stand up in a uh, in a nonviolent way, then we're going to lose. Then I just put it this way: the government is going to take our freedoms that we do have today away, and we will wake up one day and won't have them. So I get off. But uh, thank you again so much for the fine job you do. Thank you. John, I certainly appreciate the work that you have done uh, over the years with the Rutherford Institute, and we certainly encourage people to get a copy of A Government of Woes, but the newest book, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, just an outstanding book, and appreciate you joining us here on Point of View. Let's do it again sometime. Hey, thank you, Kirby. That's all we have for today. But again, let me commend to you some of the resources that uh, we have talked about. If you go to his uh, website, you will see an opportunity for you to connect up. And as he already has offered, many of you may be in a situation where you could benefit from some of their uh, defense of civil liberties and human rights. It's the Rutherford Institute. And of course, we also have information about the book. I found it in my local bookstore and bought it there, but you probably can as well. But if not, Click on the picture of the book and you can order it there either in hardcover or Kindle. It will be an eye opener. And so I do commend that book to you as well. I want to thank Andrew and Catherine and Chris and Abby for their help behind the scenes. Have a great day. See you back here tomorrow.
If billionaire Warren Buffett invited you to his house and promised to open his checkbook for you, would you go? You know, God invites his children to come into his presence at any moment, and his checkbook, well, it's much bigger than Warren Buffett's. On top of that, he loves you more than you could ever fully comprehend. He wants you to spend time with him, to bring your thanks, your praise, your petitions, for every need, for your family, for the nation. Point of View Radio does countless important things, but today we're urging you to do the most important thing of all, to pray. Visit our website at pointofview.net. Get our brand new free booklet, Pray for America. Just click on the picture that says, Pray for America. Your prayers unleash the most powerful weapon in the universe. If you're in union with Jesus Christ, your prayers touch God's heart. Get the booklet. We'll also send updates on things to pray for, like the Supreme Court as they think about marriage. Click in now, pointofview.net. Join us as we pray for America. Pointofview.net. Point of View is produced by Point of View Ministries.